Welcome everybody. Great to see you all. I'm going to switch to uh, speaker view and, and hide you so I can uh, focus on Dr. Dennis Barron. Our guest today is uh, he's a professor of uh, English and uh, in English and Linguistics Emeritus at uh, University of Illinois. And uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. So we're um, the latest book is What's Your Pronoun? We're going to talk about pronoun usage and uh, what the state of that is these days. And we're going to talk about the Second Amendment. We're going to talk about the First Amendment. We're going to do, you know, we're, we'll save the third through tenth uh, for another date. But um, we're also welcome. going to chime in yeah. real quick and let our yeah. hosts know we'd love to see him in living color. <laughs> Well, how's that? <laughs> Better? I, I, uh, there's always, always something. I remember to unmute myself before the music played so you would hear, actually hear the music. And I, and I remembered to close a uh, share screen, but I forgot to click the start video. So thank you for that, Heather. Um, welcome, uh, Dr. Barron. How are you today? I'm great. Call me Dennis, please. Dennis? Okay. I will call you Dennis. You're uh, you're emeritus professor, so you're. Um, does that mean you're uh, comfortably retired? Because you keep writing books, apparently. I'm, yeah, I'm uncomfortably retired. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's start. Let's start with this one. Actually, let's start with uh, the thing we talked about um, briefly on email. The there's a, a Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling about a, a, a case, I, I think it was yesterday, might not have been, I saw the story yesterday about uh, Shawnee State University professor. Um, this was a case of a professor at a, at a small university directly south of me here in Ohio um, on the Kentucky border, um, small town. And uh, there was a, a case of somebody who was transgender who wanted to, uh, who preferred um, that the professor use her preferred pronoun, which I believe was she, I could be mm -hmm. mistaken, yeah. it could have been that, yeah. yeah. yeah um, and the professor for religious reasons and First Amendment concerns um, said, felt that his right to being violated and sued uh, the district court, the Shawnee State, not sorry to get too much into the weeds, but Shawnee State, uh, uh, filed a motion to dismiss this. The district court agreed that it wasn't worthy of a, of a case. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati said, no, he has a case, um, let's, uh, let's hear it. So it's not a decision on, on the case, but um, what does that, uh, it, so I mean, this is the, the, we want to talk about the First Amendment, this is all, and, and we also want to talk about uh, the Epicene they. Um, what does this case mean in terms of where we are in terms of acceptance of, uh, of uh, pronouns? Well, it, it, for one thing, it shows that there's uh, still resistance to uh, non-binary or pronouns that are outside of the, the traditional binary. Uh, what, what the Meriwether case that you're talking about uh, brings up some interesting questions that uh, we've seen courts and uh, commentators start to address, which I, I frame basically as, you can't make me say your pronouns. Hmm. Uh, what, what tends to be happening is that people are raising First Amendment defenses against anti-discrimination regulations. And that can be a little worrying because um, partly because of the conservative trend in, in, in some of the court uh, mm -hmm. commentary and in, in some of the rulings. Now the Sixth Circuit basically said this can go to trial. So they didn't make a decision about whether or not Shawnee State, which is a public institution, right. private schools, uh, are under different kinds of constraints typically in, in terms of um, 
how they can control employee speech. The, the, the large issue is here, to what extent can a, an employer control employee speech? And there are lots of examples where uh, con, uh, employers normally do tell employees what they can and cannot say, uh, uh, direct sales uh, uh, over the phone. Uh, for example, uh, uh, restaurants. When uh, we used to go to restaurants, right? Uh, yeah, right. I remember. Uh, uh, in in what we now lovingly call the before times, <laughs> many of them give servers scripts that they must follow and not deviate from uh, as they interact with patrons. And um, uh, as a patron, I always found that annoying. But as a person, you have to understand uh, that your server is being made to say these things. And if, mm -hmm. if they don't, if there's a secret diner observing them or, or somebody else, uh, that can imperil their job. Yeah. Uh, but this is, this is, of course, a, a, a classroom and a, a, a classroom professor who, who has... 25 years of experience at that institution. Right tenured, the question of academic freedom uh, is involved. And the Sixth Circuit did, did affirm that university professors have academic freedom uh, in, the, in the sense that, yeah, Merriweather can refuse to utter the student's pronouns, their name, anything else that the professor wants without necessarily creating a hostile environment mm -hmm. so uh the uh there was there was a case i think it was last june uh, uh bostock versus clayton county in which the supreme court affirmed uh that title sevens uh guarantees against sex discrimination gender discrimination applied to lgbt workers mm -hmm. as as well there was a, a one case where a, a gay worker was fired and a, another where a trans worker was fired for their um for their gender and the supreme court says no you can't do that but in a dissent justice alito in a section of a very long dissent to a much shorter decision <laughs> mm -hmm. uh he labeled this section freedom of speech and in it, he tackles pronouns. And basically he's saying, this is an issue where public employees and corporations are making other people use pronouns that may violate their First Amendment speech freedom and their freedom to practice their religion. Scary stuff. Right. Uh, <laughs> Well, and is there, and that's one thing that this professor cited, he has deep religious beliefs and mm -hmm. said that calling somebody by uh, a gender, um, a word that that this professor didn't feel should apply based on uh, biological sex is is uh, is a religion, is a religious, there's religious basis for that. Is, is there? Should right. there be? Uh, well, I mean, the, the <laughs> argument is that the, the First Amendment protects a number of things. It, it pr protects you against government interference to mm -hmm. your freedom to speak and also government interference to your, your freedom to practice your religion. So those are the, the two angles that Meriwether is claiming that it's, it's compelling him to say something. The government cannot compel you mm. to speak if that speech violates some deeply held belief. And it interferes mm. on another plane with his right to practice his religion. And mm. that's uh, he's asserting as a violation of his First Amendment. So um, what you're seeing a lot is particularly uh, right-wing speakers now are claiming First Amendment protections to silence their critics, to refuse to honor uh, what, what in other sorts of situations is basically sort of normal social interaction, uh, respecting the person you speak to, 
by using their name, their title, their pronouns, whatever aspects of uh, that that we do to kind of make things go along smoothly. Mm -hmm. He's saying you can you can resist that, and of course sometimes we don't use people's titles or pronouns or names as a way of insulting them, <laughs> refusing to comply, asserting uh, authority over them. Uh, mm -hmm. That's part of social interaction too. It, it, you know, social action doesn't have to go smooth smoothly. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to like person you're talking to and you don't have to let them know you like them uh, might necessarily not necessarily help your bottom line if you're worried about making a sale yeah uh, you know, I don't want to bake a wedding cake for you so what's your uh, what, what's your um, armchair lawyer uh, view of the outcome of this case uh, well I don't even play a lawyer on TV, certainly not on, <laughs> on Zoom. Uh, we have a, at least one lawyer in the audience, I see, who probably knows a lot more about this than I do. But I think, it, yeah, I think it's worrisome that uh, potentially uh, to use something like this as an argument to, to undercut uh, the anti-discrimination regulations of whether it's uh, Title VII or uh, institutional codes of behavior, uh, it, it's, it's, it's tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, so you've been following the, the pronoun, the, the, uh, the non-gendered pronoun question for quite a long time. We're in yeah, the book jacket makes, makes it seem like I've been doing nothing but this for the last 40 <laughs> years, uh, when in fact I published something on it in the early 1980s and I put it to rest and it uh, sort of came back to me a couple of years ago uh, when I began tinkering with um, database searches because right. my, my initial research was conducted in dusty library basements, going through periodicals uh, from the 19th century, uh, many of which were falling apart and trying and were poorly indexed and just trying to look for clues to, to see people inventing pronouns, uh, coining mm -hmm. pronouns and, or talking about pronouns as, as, as a kind of linguistic issue, particularly the third person singular pronoun and its problematic uh, gender implications. Uh, but now we have digitized journals and newspapers from the 18th, 19th century, uh, much of the 20th century. And in a few clicks, I was able to, you know, find things that took me months of library research to do. Right. 40 years ago. Right, right. Um, so how do you, I, I'm curious about that process. How do you, how do you go to a dusty library, look at a book from that era and know where to look? Because I imagine yeah, right. this it's, is not it, a very it, common topic. It's, it's not a common topic. I came upon it by totally by accident. Uh, I don't remember, I was researching a book on reforms proposed for American English and I came across it I don't even remember initially how in 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 in, in the context of something else and I said oh this sounds this sounds cool uh, and I put it aside and when I finished that book I went back to it because what I do when I finish a project is have the feeling that writers always feel I have nothing left to say ever again. <laughs> and so I, 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 I looked at that original citation and it led to another. And, and, and basically what I was looking for is breadcrumbs. You know, one citation right. will reference another. And I see that in 1884, a number of people were talking about this. 
So I looked at um, literary journals from 1884, checking particular months where this discussion started and going through indexes, tables of contents, looking at letters of, to the editor section where they commonly would appear as responses. Uh, those were our comment sections back then. And um, just trying to trying to create a trail. Yeah, uh, and and I did you find that there were errors that I mean that for some reason that it it picked up and yeah yeah, yeah there there, there was, uh, so this 1884 was a, a very productive year because um, one literary journal uh, prints a, a short note from a guy named C C Converse. Now, C.C. Converse, some of the people who coined pronouns in the 19th century were obvious crackpots and nutcases, but they were also coined by people who were serious, serious and well-known. Converse was a very famous composer, and he was mostly known for writing hymns. He wrote, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, but he wrote numerous, numerous hymns, he was widely known uh, throughout the country, gave concerts, gave talks. He was also a lawyer. And uh, so in 1884, he said, I've got a pronoun. And it's spelled T-H-O-N, thon. It's a blend of that hmm. and one. Hmm. And it will solve the problem of having to say he or she when you don't know the gender of the person you're addressing or talking about. And uh, nobody likes to say he or she because it's redundant. The next time you have a pronoun, you have to say him or her, his or her. And it gets, uh, people say it was clumsy, it was awkward, it was redundant, it was, it was stylistically inappropriate. Nobody ever liked it. Right. So he said, here's the pronoun, you just use this. You don't know whether you're talking or you want to be inclusive and include both men and women. Use Thon. Mm -hmm. And of course I kinda like Thon. Over over the next couple honest. of months, people began writing to the journal and saying, mm -hmm. Well, great idea. We need such a pronoun, but I get a better idea. I get a better pronoun. So, you know, uh, the, the better pronoun crowd weighed in. And then the crowd uh, that said, Well, no, no, we we've got we've got he, you know, he's generic. So they weighed in. Uh, nobody at the time was defending generic she. Uh, but there were there were times when when the generic feminine uh, was also under consideration. But anyway, the, the newspapers picked up the story, and so it spread around the country. Other people weighed in with their pronouns, and so so 1884, 85. Uh, was a kind of watershed year, but, but, but so was 1912 when Ella Young, who was the superintendent of the Chicago public schools, first woman to head the public schools in Chicago. She had been the um, first woman who was president of the National Education Association before that. She uh, offered he or his or him or the blend of masculine and feminine pronouns. And so that hit the news. There was a story in the Chicago Trib that was repeated over and over again by papers all over the country. People responded to it, supporting it, hating it. Uh, and that became a big thing or proposing other pronouns. Um, mm -hmm. The editor of Harper's attacked her uh for so it was it, it, it was a it was a big thing mm -hmm. and uh so I, well, here's the question i really want to i want to get to is what at what point in this history uh did you first become aware of the non-gendered use or the or the non-binary use i should say of they because it's always a question of does it include women uh when you use the masculine um, mm -hmm. So, at what point does does do we get into the well, idea that so so they they has a very long history as a non gendered 
singular pronoun uh, goes back to the 14th century in English. Uh, what's new about and it was sort of the default pronoun in speech. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of people use, you know, somebody left a book. Uh, I hope they come back for it. Right. In, in writing, it was not quite as common, but it was it was used by edited writers of major publications. Uh, mm -hmm. Jane Austen used, I think, singular they. Somebody counted over two hundred times in her novels. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was colloquially appropriate. Yeah, the, the, and the OED has some great. Yeah. Examples going mm -hmm. back, um, and an ad, and I'm just remembering an ad in a London newspaper in uh, uh, 17th century, perhaps about you know flowers and uh, for sale, and people can have as many as they want, or or, or it was a singular, yeah, yeah, yeah. you you can have yeah. as many as yeah. they want. I sure. can't remember the wording exactly, but but that's um, but that's the 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 non-binary. Nobody was at that point thinking. Right, right. That, we have to respect. That, that wasn't really uh, uh, in public discussion until much more recently. So, you know, in the last mm -hmm. 20, 30 years, you start mm -hmm. uh, dealing with or or, or, or encountering uh, non-binary situations. Uh, so that you have. I mean, I found a couple of commentaries from transgender people in the 1990s who lamented the fact that there was no pronoun that quite fit uh, what they wanted to, mm -hmm. to use. Uh, one of them actually says, uh, there is no pronoun to describe me. But by uh, probably around that time, there already was, they just weren't aware of it. But, but starting in the 2000s and up to today, people were discussing this as you know a solution to the issue of what pronoun to use for non non-binary to refer to non-binary mm -hmm. people, trans or non-binary, mm -hmm. gender non-conforming. Right, and that and that and I imagine that. Um... You you have these errors that, as far as we know, there was sort of a a large number, large amount of discussion about this. I imagine now, I don't think it's just recency illusion that this is now a time that it is very much in the public discussion. Yeah, yeah, it, it is to, to the point. Well, the recency illusion is is to imagine that there weren't such pronouns available before the immediate, you know, the last mm -hmm. 10, 15 years. And, and so people are calling them neo-pronouns, when in fact many of the neo-pronouns were coined in the mid-19th century. The pronoun E, just the letter E, mm -hmm. E-S-M-M, -M, uh, first came on the scene in 1841. It was coined by a mm -hmm guy who had recently finished his MD at Yale and apparently medicine wasn't doing it for him because the year after he finished his MD he published a grammar book of English and in that grammar book he proposed this with well he didn't he didn't propose it he just said here it is this is we have the, the masculine we have the feminine <laughs> And then we have what he called the masculo feminine. <laughs> e is it? Cap capitalized, he caps the E, then E S for the possessive and M E M for the dative and accusative. And it just gave it as as, as He as, presented this as a uh, no discussion. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately he nobody read his grammar book. <laughs> The only copy I was able to find of the grammar book, extant, is in the uh, was in the Yale Library, presumably 
because he gave them a copy of it. <laughs> he gave them that copy. I don't think many people bought it. And um, the, the World Cat lists that Yale copy as the only one in their in their survey of, of it. And so I, I uh, my son was a grad student at Yale at the time, a couple of years ago. And so I said, there's this book at the library. Can you, uh, can you get that for me? Because I didn't have access to the Yale library. And uh, he put in a request. They sent it. They made a PDF of it for him. Hmm. And he sent that to me. And um, then um, a librarian at Yale emailed me and said, oh, my God, this is fantastic. You found this. This is the pronoun I'm going to use. <laughs> and uh, then I, we were going out to visit our son. And so I said, look, can you set up a, a thing where I can actually see the book? Because I wanted to take pictures of it for, for my book. And uh, he said, sure. But then they couldn't find it because they had decided after my initial query, that this might be something valuable and they were gonna transfer it to the rear book room, to, to, the, rear, to, to the Beinecke from the, it was uh -huh. in the stacks. Uh, and oh. uh, so it was out for, for restoration, but they were managed to secure it and let me photograph it when we, when we, we visited. I'd be tempted to write to that librarian and find out if that is the pronoun how she get, how E got along with that pronoun. Uh, yeah, I never had any follow up <laughs> from them. So, uh, I the, the uh, trouble with invented languages, you kind of, well, I know all languages invented, but uh, invented, you know, neologisms, neolog, neologisms, they're only, they only work if people use them. And, uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's anybody can coin a word, you know, I used to get emails from people, I invented a word, and I always wanted yeah. to get in the dictionary. <laughs> and could you, prom could you promote it for me, you know, and, and, and things like that. And sure. that's why I guess that's why the urban dictionary is popular, because you can just upload right. your word. And there it is. Uh, right. So uh, how many? Uh, how many is on your list of uh, pronouns well it, it depends on how you count them but it's well over 200 uh some of them are, are are were invented independently a few times and so oh. I, I i count each one as separate because they were independently coined even if even though it was the same word but you know lexicographers have that issue too how do, you, how do you count how many words are in your dictionary? Right. Uh, right. I mean, the, the marketing department's more concerned about that than the actual lexicographer is. But they, they right. want to decide what's a word, what's a head word, when you, when you need a separate head, head word for, for the word, things like that. But um, okay. so there's a lot. That. There's a lot. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. the interesting thing about Vaughn uh, coined in 1884, although um, Funk and Wagnalls dates it from 1858. And, and apparently what happened is Converse said when he coined on, I started experimenting with this many years ago, didn't specify when hmm. or what other things he tried out. But my guess is that he, he and, and Isaac Funk got into a, a, a correspondence because Funk put it in, his dic in, in the standard dictionary. And I assume that there's a letter that Converse sent to Funk saying, I, I, I first thought it up in 1858, <laughs> because that's the standard date, but the only published reference to it is 1884. That's the earliest published. That's when he's, he set it out upon the world. And it was still mm -hmm. in use by a limited number of people well into the 1970s. Oh, so is that, uh, would you call that a, a marginal success story I, compared I, to? Uh, I, I'd say it was very successful but, yeah. considering yeah. the longevity of it. And, and, and you could sort of track people using it off and on. 
uh, from 1840 into the 1970s when one of its few surviving proponents writes to Tom Wicker in the New York Times and says, you're looking for a gender neutral pronoun, here's Don, you know, it, it's been around mm -hmm. for a long time. He, he'd been using it. Uh, and uh, he was also a, a musician, which may have had something, something to, <laughs> to, to do with, uh, you know, sort of idolizing converse, perhaps. But, um, uh. And here, so him, I, and him are the blends of masculine and feminine, multiply mm. coined over and over again, uh, different variations of it, some of them putting the feminine part of the pronoun first, uh, mm -hmm. some of them the masculine. It's, it's uh, that, that, that's the most common reinvented word. Mm -hmm. The sort of here, do, do you think he's he's. Yeah, right. Well, you know, let's do, I have a question, but I want to, uh, we also have a question from the, from the audience. So we, we want to make sure we get to those. Yes. Mike, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Dennis. Um, so Hi. do you know of a language, uh, out, speaking outside of English, in which they do have this gendered pronoun, but also have a pronoun for ungendered or, you know, third gender or whatever you want to call it? There are some. There are some. I don't. I don't. I don't know the details, but I. I, I have read um, a, a, a couple of, of, of accounts of uh, languages, not not with you know huge numbers of speakers. This one in, in sort of the this Indonesia area somewhere uh, where there are five different genders uh, in, in the pronoun system to reflect for, for human genders, five, five different ways that they categorize, categorize people's genders, masculine, feminine, uh, gay, masculine, gay, feminine, uh, and sort of trans slash intersex uh, mm. is, is the way that the one description I saw the, characterized, and I don't know how accurate that is, you know, I mean, you'd have to sort of follow up on, on those things. Yeah. But the point that the, that the writer was making is that having multiple genders uh, in that particular society was perfectly normalized. It, it, it was nothing to to cause attention or lawsuits or <laughs> right the deeply yeah. held religious beliefs or, yeah yeah uh, so is there is there a future for uh, pronouns to describe um, uh, are there, is there a future for some of these invented, we'll call, I call them invented, you know, that, that aren't widely used? Do they have a future or is they now well, gaining no, acceptance? They, so. they do, they do, because um, there are groups of people who have adopted um, alternative pronouns. Hmm. Uh, not huge groups. Uh, how widespread they are at the moment is a little difficult to characterize because all of the surveys that are conducted are uh, voluntary in, in, in terms so so in terms of survey methodology it's not a really accurate count because you're only getting people who are interested in the issue who are responding to it and and so uh, surveys of trans uh, speakers of English have tended to show for the last few years uh, that uh, the binary pronouns, the he and she, are the, are the pronouns that most people choose to reflect their gender. So if, you're, if you've transitioned, you adopt the pronoun of the gender that you have transitioned to, the binary pronoun. Right. The, those are the two big categories. Uh, the next big category is singular they. And then you have groups of people 
who use coined pronouns. Uh, and there, there are enough of them to count, but their percentages are, are small. So maybe 5% of uh, survey respondents pick one of the neo pronouns with coined pronouns. I don't like neo because they're not new, but mm -hmm. that seems to be a term that's spreading. Yeah, I think in them. your book you mentioned the, the different things they're called. I can't remember oh, what you they, settled they on. Oh, they were called so <laughs> many different things. Epicene, bisexual, yeah. uh, there's the masculo-feminine of, 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 right. <laughs> of uh, Dr. Brewster from 1841. Um, so I, I wanted to get to one other question in the room before we yeah. move on. Robert, I didn't know if you wanted to unmute and ask. If you mean me, and I'm not sure you do, it wasn't. A yes, <laughs> it wasn't a question, just a oh. a clarifying comment. All right. Well, if, if we, we've got you now. Let's uh, want you yeah, share it, it. If you could share it again. Put your money where your mouth is. Um, well, uh, no money was involved in doing this, so my <laughs> my mouth already spoke. Okay. Again, it, okay. you know, I just chatted that um, when you referred to um, that famous or infamous bake shop case. Um, yeah. I can't remember the plaintiff's or defendants or the name of the case. Masterpiece Cake Shop. Thank versus you. Versus Chicago, South Colorado Civil Rights Commission. And <laughs> you referred to um, if you don't want to bake a cake for someone something like that yeah from my understanding though that's how it was often portrayed um the what generated that suit was not um we don't want to bake a cake for you it was we don't want to write the message you want us to write on the cake well actually which is a somewhat yeah. different thing yeah because based on, and I just having, as a matter of fact, it was more alarming reading an article in defense of that interpretation of it, because if someone can be forced to write a message which violates their convictions, I'm just looking at this disinterestedly, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm not a baker and have no retail shop. <laughs> if someone can be forced to, um, I rely on bakers, if someone can be forced to write a message they don't believe in, right. then can a, as I wrote in that, can a sign painter be forced to write a sign um, that in praise of Nazis or Louis Farrakhan or the KKK? And for that matter, to bring it closer to home, though I think that's a relevant example, can an editor uh, or indexer or writer be forced to edit, index, or write a book or track in support of any of those causes or any other cause that violates their deepest convictions. It, that could include causes that don't violate the convictions of some people on this list or don't violate mine. Um, but I've in fact turned down manuscripts because I thought their, some of the content was objectionable or, or actually inaccurate and the author wasn't open to being correct. Anyway, that was, as I say, it wasn't a question, but since you asked me to uh, vocalize it, there it is. Okay, yeah, no, that, that, this is perfectly uh, reasonable comment, and, and, and it's a thorny issue because uh, as professional editors, uh, you can refuse a job, okay? Uh, if you have a store or you run a business that uh, offers public accommodation of some kind, you normally are expected to comply with the public accommodation rules, which are things like you, if somebody comes in and wants to buy something, as long as they're, you know, decorum is is okay you know the they satisfy the no shoes no shirt no service no kidding 
on your sign, you have to sell to them. You have to rent your hotel room to them. You have to serve them at the counter, the lunch counter, or the table if, if you're a restaurant. The question so there's... in Masterpiece Cake was, the, the baker claimed you could come in no matter what your sexual preference or gender expression or whatever, and buy anything we have in the shop. I will not make anything to order for you. And what he claimed was, if I write a message on the cake, which was basically, it was two guy, two gay guys who were getting married, basically, congratulations, you know, John Doe and John Doe. That violates my deeply held belief that uh, gay marriage is uh, sinful against my, my religion. And the question then is whose speech is the writing on the cake? Is that the baker's speech or is that the speech of the client? Right. And, and that's, that's why there's concern over the fact that if you raise free speech issues to challenge anti-discrimination regulations, which basically is pitting the First Amendment against the 14th Equal Protection Clause, 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, what happens? The amendments are supposed to have equal force. Is it, gen is it, are we, is it generally true that, uh, you know, thinking in my lifetime, people become more accepting? I'm thinking about the, the Shawnee State professor whose religious beliefs and uh, free speech um, desires uh, will keep him from using the person's preferred pronoun. Is it, and to me that all, it already seems a little bit uh, antiquated in 10 years and 20 years, is it simply going to see, seem that much more antiquated? Well, I, my, my sense is that as, as we're, we're trending towards a sit, social situation where gender nonconformity is becoming less and less remarkable. Mm -hmm. In other words, more and more accepted in the sense that people are not making a fuss about it. And that is, will eventually have some, some uh, will play out eventually in our attitudes toward language describing or referencing gender nonconformity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, th I think right now pronouns are, it, it, the gender issues with pronouns are political, but as things uh, change and, and gender itself becomes a little less political, the pressure on the language will be, will be relieved as right. well. We've got one more question from the room. I wanted to ask one thing though that um sort of along those lines so you, so you you helped with the, the apa uh, yes the apa the new seven i edition. recognize the spine <laughs> yeah much nicer than the sixth edition um i'm much more a fan and i and i really do love if you know if, if you have it at home you know, please take the time to read and i think i think on the website they talk about um using uh gender neutral uh pronouns as well the the, the just a little tip, if you go to the APA website, they put a lot on there that they didn't used to have to mm. sort of uh, talk about what their changes are. There's one thing that struck me, and I think as, and I think this is a case where the more I become used to it, the less it will seem odd to me. But um, there's a, mm -hmm. a statement here, when referring to, uh, when referring to individuals whose identified pronouns are not known, uh, dot, 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 use the singular they to avoid making assumptions. So when I read that, I thought, well, 
So every time I don't know the gender preference of an author, I should use they. Now in practical use in an academic uh, setting, it's maybe multiple authors, and so you're fine using they. Um, but there are, and, and of course with APA style, I think there's no full name anyway, there's no first name, so you really don't necessarily know the gender. Mm. Um, and it struck me, and that's, that struck me as something I thought, well, people aren't going to do that. They're going to know the name. They're going to, on, on another reference, they'll use the assumed gender based mm -hmm. on the name. And, and what, what they're suggesting is that you think first before you do that. Yeah. It, it, okay. it does strike so, but, me. But so, so this kind of pronoun use has been common and remarked upon at least since the 18th century. So I, there was a, a little debate in um, uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts newspaper in the 1790s over uh, some someone who used a singular they and someone wrote in raising an objection to it. And the authors responded, it was a multiply authored uh, column. And they basically said, we use singular they in order to mask the identity of the person we were talking about. So singular they has been used not simply to affirm someone's gender identity, but to hide it in cases where you don't want to out the individual. It could be embarrassing what you're saying about them. So uh, more recently, uh, three years, four years ago, when there was uh, an anonymous op-ed in the Times, the New York Times, about uh, people in the former doubly impeached person who had inhabited the White House's Right. I dare not speak his name, trying to prevent him from doing anything even more stupid than he was, that they, they thought, or, or dangerous than that. Mm -hmm. and, and in order to protect the identity of the author, the Times referred to that person as they, mm -hmm. Because they didn't even want to reveal the gender, even if they didn't know the name, because that would give a clue for people trying to track down who this was mm -hmm. to put them on their enemies list, or right. if not worse. Uh, and they, they explicitly said, yeah, we, we're using they to, to conceal yeah. the identity. And, and that's... Novelists have used singular they to conceal the identity to preserve suspense. Mm. Uh, hmm. until you know you really get to figure out who the killer is or something like that mm -hmm. so it, 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 it's been uh, available in the in the toolkit for a right. long time not just for the case where you don't know someone's gender but for the case where you do but you want to conceal it or for cases where saying the gender is distracting from some other issue that you're really talking about hmm Okay. Well, in AP style now, uh, that's one of the changes in AP style mm -hmm. is that they is perfectly acceptable for an anonymous source where you don't yeah, want to reveal the... I've, I've heard that the MLA is going to do something similar in the next edition of its um, publication style guide. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I haven't sure. seen it. I haven't seen anything more definite yet. Right. Um, we have one more question. We're, we're getting low on time and I've got about... 20 questions left probably but we have one more question from the from the audience we do yes christine if you'd like to unmute and ask your question yeah hello um i love your book so much thank you it's profoundly affected my life and um even as a student i mean a teacher of students um i share about your book um one thing you said in your book was what's your pronoun is not a question that many people like to answer so I wondered if that was one um, main reason that you wanted to write the book so that maybe you could make this topic more comfortable for the communities or the public. Um, I was curious about that. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's part of the general movement to normalize and unmark, to use a, a linguistic term, uh, non-binary pronouns, but also to, to let people know that there's a lot of historical support for using for using. This is not just some nouveau trendy development that uh, that Justice Alito fears is going to, you know, destroy the fabric of Western society or whatever. I, I'm putting words into his mouth, but who cares? <laughs> Well, speaking of putting words into uh, Justice Alito's mouth, um, or a, a justice, I suppose, uh, you've, uh, you, you were involved in the Washington, D.C., the Heller case, uh, the Second Amendment case, and you, and you told me you were, you were working on something in California with the Attorney General there, a Second Amendment, a gun rights uh, They're, they're dealing with a, a, a Second Amendment case, and yeah. It, is that something you could tell us about? Uh, well, I, I can tell you about the Heller Heller case. Which sure. Was okay. Basically, the um, I the case before Heller, the case uh, that was decided in the District of Columbia Circuit Court, which um, was then appealed to the Supreme Court. I wrote when when that decision was published. Uh, the 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 judge who wrote the opinion, Lawrence Silberman, uh, part of the opinion dealt with the punctuation in the Second Amendment uh, mm -hmm. as sort of help, helping him decide that the militia clause, the, the way the amendment begins, a well-regulated militia, uh, was could be safely ignored because it was separated from the rest of the amendment by a comma. And I wrote an op-ed in the LA Times saying, no, doesn't work. punctuation doesn't work that way. And um, so I got a call from the DC Attorney General's office when, when they appealed that decision uh, to the Supreme Court, asking if I would do a kind of historical analysis of what the Second Amendment meant in the 1790s with the words of this, the words and the grammar of the amendment. So that got me involved in, in Second Amendment analysis. And so one of the things I argued was, you know, you, you can't dismiss the militia clause. Um, made some comments about what, what the, another issue is, what does the right to bear bear arms, uh, is that a sort of collective right uh, that uh, a community needs to be prepared to defend itself in case of attack from inside or outside? Mm -hmm. And the other is, is, is this an individual right? And everybody has the right to be armed to protect themselves individually. And so uh, I and, and a couple of co-authors argued basically that this was a collective right, at least in terms of the Second Amendment. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody says uh, anything about personal self-defense, but the amendment is silent about personal self-defense. It's talking about community protection and organized uh, military or military-like activity, like a militia, like an army, like a uh, uh, as opposed to sort of an individual response, right. uh, which I, I, to, which I wasn't, attack. I wasn't aware of that until I, I read recently your uh, Washington Post article mm -hmm. you yeah. wrote a few years yeah. ago about that, and you looked at the corpus mm -hmm. um, and found that bare arms without it's, a military meaning. It's, it's much rarer. Very, it's very, very rare. rare. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so that's uh, interesting. Now, the, the, the comma thing, there are two commas in there. It's just totally right. confusing. I have no idea why they wrote it the way they did. 
Uh, <laughs> But, it's the um, way they did things in the 18th century. I mean, yeah. what what the are the commons? I understand, but the but why why put the sort of the reasoning first and then? Oh, because no. I don't think that's done in any other amendment, is it? Uh, it it's the only one that has a yeah. a a rationale uh, mm. that, that precedes it in the in the drafting of the amendment. Uh, it went through six versions. So five, one initial re version and five revisions. Hmm. The uh, militia clause was originally somewhere in the middle. And in the first revision, they, who, uh, Congress revised it. Madison drafted it, Congress revised it. And they put the militia clause at the beginning. And it survived all the other edits. There was initially a clause in there too uh, in the Second Amendment that exempted conscientious objectors from the militia service. But it, at some point, the Congress just dropped it. So it didn't make it into the final, the final cut. Uh, but in the director's cut, <laughs> it was there and that reinforces the military sense. Yeah. Um... We're, 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 as I suspected, we're um, we're over time by a little bit. Um, you're, you've got a book coming out, Unprotected Speech. You can't always say what you want. That sounds very timely. We've talked. I think soon we've talked about a few it's things. Very rock and roll. In that book, <laughs> when's that? Uh, when are we going to see that one? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still marketing it. Oh, okay. Still, uh, all right. Still. And then you've got a, another one in the, in the works, in the back yeah. of your mind, or? Yeah, um, the next project will be called Shibboleth, and its subtitle is Policing the Internet from Babel, Policing Language from Babel to the Internet, sorry, hmm. Shibboleth. And I started yeah. by talking about the Shibboleth story, which is, you know, the classic, right. well, actually, Babel itself is, is, I say, is a kind of language policing where the deity says, you know, I'm going to control your language for, as a punishment. <laughs> Where are we in terms of the Internet? What's the... We're on the Internet right now. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of I policing the you. language. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about language, though. We're not policing yeah. the language. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, that's the, there's, there's a job that editors do, which is to conform language to house style. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what, what we're seeing on the internet is, is uh, so for example, Rudy Giuliani's tweeted something, I, f I forget what, uh, 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 about Joe Biden and, and, and what are the comments, and, and, and it, it was, oh, you know, maybe not yeah. as carefully written as well, he usually has. What would what would expect? He, he, he's yeah. Been, when every three or four tweets, Rudy Giuliani mm -hmm. has a has yeah. an odd typo in there. Yeah, yeah America's former mayor. Uh, yeah. He's seen better times, I suppose. But there, there, a number of the responses attacked his grammar, and somebody uh, re replied to what he said in support of what he said. The cavalry is coming. And another person immediately replied, so are the language police. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering about that. If, if, if you don't think correcting other people's language in sort of informal situation, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about professional editing. I'm talking about, you know, somebody posts something on the internet instead of attacking their idea, you attack the, oh, you split an infinitive, you moron. Mm -hmm. I hate to stop uh, the conversation, but, you know, people probably want to go get dinner or whatever. And uh, maybe we'll get you back uh, with the Shibboleth book or the Unprotected Speech book. We guess, you know, there's there's great uh, topics for people who work with words and are interested in words. So I appreciated your time for the past hour. And, oh, uh, happy, happy to be conversation. here. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Remember, actually, next Thank week you. is the ACES conference, and we're going to do uh, the That Word Chat is um, sponsor of the happy hour. So get a drink, get some snacks. Uh, we're not going to provide any this time, but uh, you're on your own there. But um, we'll provide the Zoom meeting, and you can sign up uh, for that online. And in two weeks, um, we've got a couple of... Uh, 
Uh, we've got representatives from ACES and the EFA, their uh, diversity and inclusion committees. Um, so we have Marisha Morant and Sanjita Mita, which I'm probably mispronouncing. I apologize to her, but uh, that should be very interesting in two weeks. So um, see you next, see you in two weeks, if not next week. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.